All right. All right. We're good. How you doing, Ryan? Doing well. How are you? I'm good, man. Thank you very much for agreeing to participate and, and uh, um, you know, give me the opportunity to do this interview. Absolutely. So, first of all, young man, I followed you for a while on Instagram. I love what you do. Um, Thank you. But for the people who might be watching this live or later on when we post it, um, if they don't know who you are, please take a minute to tell them who you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, so real quick, my name is Ryan Ford. I, I guess I'm most well known for parkour and my background in various sports and strength training and mobility, power, uh, speed, all that kind of stuff. I have a huge interest in athletics in general and just becoming a better athlete, a better human, uh, mentally and physically. And I think that parkour is a great mixture of those two things. You know, you build a stronger body, a stronger mind, you become more confident, creative, um, and it's very well-rounded. You climb, you jump, you land, you roll, you crawl. It's kind of a, a blend of so many different things that we do in parkour or in sports in general. So uh, yeah, my, my background is parkour and athletics in general. All right. So first question then, young man, is mm -hmm. where did your love of parkour come from? Yeah, so I guess just to back up even more, my background started out in soccer. So I did soccer from age three to 13. And then I kind of also dabbled in basketball, tennis, all kinds of different traditional team sports and ball sports. And then in high school, I was kind of burnt out on soccer and I transitioned over to track and field as well as football. That's also where I got my introduction to weightlifting and strength training in general. Um, so I was a scrawny little 15-year-old kid, you know, just starting to play football, the weakest kid on the whole team, brand new to football. And I, I had to do something to keep up and kind of uh, earn some respect. So I got really into lifting, benching, deadlift, back squat, all this kind of stuff. And then um, a little bit later on in high school, I found parkour. So um, I don't know exactly how this all started, but um, I think we may have seen something in the movies or YouTube, but me and my friends wanted to learn how to do a wall flip. So where you run up the wall and back flip off and um, we're all standing outside of the school library one day. It's like this really nice brick wall, grassy landing. We think it's a good spot to learn this crazy flip that we saw. And we're like, okay, who's going to do it first? And, <laughs> <laughs> and we had no idea what we were doing. We didn't know how to spot. We didn't have mats. We didn't have anything. Uh, we're just some stupid high school kids trying to do something new. And my buddy who did ninjutsu, so martial arts background, he steps up to the plate and he's like, I think I know how this works. I got this. And he just steps up. He takes two steps up the wall and falls down flat on his back and <laughs> completely knocks the wind out of himself. He's like rolling around on the ground, gasping for air. And we're all like, oh, man, like, I do not want to try that. So, um yeah, we were all kind of terrified by that sight. However, he got up and took like five, 10 minutes, regathered himself, thought about it, and was like, I got this. I think I get it. I got this next try. So he actually stepped up and on his second try, he nailed it. He took two steps off the wall and just stomped it, landed on his feet, and he's totally good. But uh, after seeing that, nobody else wanted to try it. So we ended up going online and I think we found some kind of a uh, like tutorial or something. This is actually before YouTube existed. So, uh, or right around when YouTube exists or started up in, I think 2004 or 2005. And yeah, so we kind of found some parkour videos. I was actually still kind of in the football world and I was going to this kind of legendary concert venue in the Denver area called Red Rocks Amphitheater. And it's this beautiful place built into the, the sandstone rocks. Um, right where the foothills kind of meet the plains. And they have, I think, like a hundred massive rows of seating all the way up to the top. So I would go there to run the steps and condition for football and get into shape. And I found myself just kind of looking around after seeing parkour and I was like, okay, sure. What can I'm I not... jump off? Yeah, can I jump from <laughs> there to there? Or can I do that thing that I saw in that video? And really the only thing that I had to learn from because nobody else, as far as I could tell, did parkour in Colorado at the time. So I was downloading videos on my parents' dial-up modem overnight. Um, these are some of the original parkour videos from Paris, France, or the suburbs of Paris, France. Mm -hmm. um, 
And yeah, I just uh, kind of watch the videos and then go out and try it and teach myself. And a couple of years later, I found myself teaching some classes as kind of a, a leader in the community here who had some experience and more and more people wanted to try it. Eventually, we started teaching our own programs out of, out of other gyms. And then we started our own gym, um, first off in Denver and then in Boulder. And since then, we expanded it. And we've got an online education arm as well called Parkour EDU. So yeah, at this point, I, I do parkour, I coach it, I teach all kinds of people, we teach coaches, we teach um, high level athletes, we teach total beginners, um, people of all ages. And we teach online and in real life. And yeah, that's what we do. Okay. And um, just as a, a follow up to that. So I, I've seen the parkour EDU. And, mm -hmm. and you are a level three parkour coach. Now is that a certification do you have developed? or you played a yep. part in developing? Yeah, so when we started um, teaching, again, we didn't really have much to go off of. We were just kind of winging it. And uh, back in the day, we actually started out of a bouldering gym. So we were teaching parkour in the corner of the spot bouldering gym in Boulder, Colorado. That's where we got our start. So shout out to them. They've always been amazingly supportive over the years. And yeah, we, we were originally just teaching two hour classes for five bucks and people kept showing up and we kept learning and we kept tweaking our curriculum. And over time we kept revising and reiterating and uh, turning that curriculum into something more in depth. And eventually that became our own coaching certification, which I developed um, mostly along with my business partner, Amos Rendow. And of course, many other local legends and athletes and coaches, they all contributed and Boulder, Denver, Colorado kind of became this hub at least for parkour in the USA. I think I was just in the right place at the right time and our community grew fast and it grew bigger before pretty much anywhere else, at least in uh, the USA. And yeah, that's kind of, I had no idea all this is going to unfold as it did, but that's where we are now. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. I like that story. So um, one of the things that I noticed when I um, started to uh, look up, uh, the stuff that you have a little bit more in depth and, and look at some of your videos. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found that you, so you approach parkour in a very systematic way and you break down skills and techniques um, and you work on develop, fu developing fundamental skills. So yep. why do you, uh, so I have to tell you as an orthopedic surgeon, I have operated on quite a few parkour practitioners oh, really? in, in, in my own area not so much now but when parkour first came out plenty um, hmm. so you approach uh, parkour in a very systematic way why do you approach parkour in this manner and do you think that it is a more effective approach for training parkour athletes mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, there's, I guess, a lot I could say on that. But um, first off, I don't consider myself to be like a reckless, crazy parkour stereotype person. And I think just hearing that, you know, of course, like I was just out training on the CU Boulder campus yesterday. And unfortunately, we hear the hardcore parkour, like the office parkour meme joke that I think it's almost like five, 10 years old already. But uh, it's just you know, we get this public perception of crazy people jumping buildings and doing double backflips and destroying our bodies. And that's really not the case. At least that's not the case for most people who do parkour. And so, you know, me identifying as somebody who's way more cautious, like as a little kid, my friends would climb up onto the very top of the playground and just jump off and they'd be, they'd have so much fun. And I'd be sitting up there like, are you guys like, are you for real? Like, I don't know if I can jump off this. And so I'd actually, even as a little kid, I'd go find something shorter to jump off. And then I'd like gradually work my way up. So I think that mentality was just kind of, maybe I was born with it to an extent, but also, um, you know, getting into parkour and having no idea what I was doing early on, having nobody to learn from other than some YouTube videos. Um, I was forced to I was scared of everything. So I had to find a way to be able to work up to some of these other, you know, scary, harder, difficult things. And um, for me, the, the secret was to find progressions, to find um, a smart, gradual or incremental way to build up to some of these other things. So for example, um, you don't, if you know that you can jump 10 feet on the ground, standing jump, uh, you're not going to just 
do that a couple times and then go try it up high. You know, you're going to do it hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of times down low. And you're going to gradually make that thing bigger and you're going to gradually build it up higher. And in that sense, if you're careful and gradual about the progression, um, the jump, it doesn't matter if it's on the ground level or 50 feet off the ground. If that's a 10 foot jump, either way, it's technically the same exact thing. And the only hurdle or obstacle is in your own head. So mentally you have to align with what you're physically capable of. And yeah, I think, uh, also just my background in weightlifting and all these other team sports. And also, um, originally when we opened apex, it was a CrossFit affiliate because we did not know if parkour could be a thing, like if that was a viable business or a gym possibility. So we started off as CrossFit affiliate as well. And I got my CrossFit cert, I think back in like 2007 or eight. And that kind of blew my mind as far as just seeing all the different progressions and the thought that they had put into it. And yeah, I wanted that to be in parkour as well. So at the time, it was like unheard of to have a parkour curriculum. I knew some other people who were teaching, but they did not have a curriculum. They did not necessarily think about the progressions and variations. And um, we wanted to bring that into the world of parkour. I think also in gymnastics, you see it all the time. Like there is a progression and a, a map and a structure for everything. And not that I want to put parkour in a box and make it super structured and um, like gymnastics, but I did draw inspiration from that world. And we wanted to create something that had progressions and was safer and um, able to scale up and down for any type of person, no matter what their age or their um, skill level, their fitness level, whatever. So, yeah, I think a systematic approach is key for just about anything. Okay, very cool, very cool. So let's talk a little bit about basics now, okay? So um, obviously, as you said, it, you can't put parkour in a box, right? But if you were to think about parkour as a, um, as a larger entity, okay, what are the fundamental principles of training for parkour athletes? Yeah, that's, that's hard to say because parkour is so open-ended. It's like a, it's a bug and a feature or a strength and a weakness. Um, parkour kind of has this identity crisis that's ongoing where some people train for speed and practicality. Some people train for fun or social aspects. Mm -hmm. Some people train for style or acrobatic, aesthetic, difficulty kind of uh, perspective. So somebody who's running through the environment, doing a bunch of flips and training for the aesthetics and the difficulty, it's almost like you can't even compare that mindset or that intention to somebody who's training for, I want to go A to B as fast as possible. And I only care about the practical stuff. Kind of like, that's almost like a MMA or like a rock climbing or track and field mentality. Whereas the style route is a little more like gymnastics or tricking, break dancing, um, so it's really difficult to, you have to get more specific. So people try to lump all that stuff together as like parkour, um, especially the outsider, the untrained eye, and it all maybe looks very similar to them. But when you start peeling back the layers of that onion, many people in parkour are training with completely different intentions or mindsets. And when you identify that, then you can finally be like, okay, well, personally, and I'm, I'm actually speaking for myself now. So personally, I am more interested in the practical speed kind of elements of parkour. I'm um, coming from a track and field background. I'm also really into bouldering and rock climbing and UFC and MMA. We were talking about earlier. That's one of my favorite things nowadays, just because of the, the practicality and the self-defense elements. Um, so if I were to just narrow in and then answer your question from a speed or practical parkour kind of uh, mentality i'd say actually what was the original question it was like what are the fundamentals of? fundamental principles of yeah training. yeah so um you could you could probably extend these to most other areas of parkour but um there are these variations and differences so at least from a speed or practical parkour mentality um the basics are you start very low to the ground you start off with your quadrupedal movement uh, moving on all fours you learn how to squat and land Eventually, you learn how to balance and jump. Um, if you could think of a, a couple ways that we guide our progression, it's simple to complex. It's low, low to ground, and progressively getting higher off of the ground. 
Um, we're also, we tend to start a little bit slower and we progress to things that are faster or more dynamic, such as jumping or running um, type movements. And yeah, I think one of, really the key is a lot of people get, park, they get hurt in parkour because they try to do too much too fast and they try to go too high off the ground or they're just, they're getting ahead of themselves. And what you really need to do in parkour, especially if you're training in an environment that is unforgiving with concrete and metal and hard things that you cannot beat. <laughs> You're not gonna win a collision with a metal rail or a concrete wall. Um, so you have to be smarter. Your, your protection is your own head. It's your progressions, it's your mentality on how you can um, cautiously and intelligently break something down and progress. So I think um, it's not so much about the movements being like basics. It's more about understanding the mentality of how you can approach this um, and not get hurt because too many people skip over that. And then next thing you know, you're they're on your operating table and that's not good. Uh, I, I like very much what you said about uh, the progressions. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when I think about training athletes or clients at our, at our facility, we're always trying to break things down into um, various progressions that will allow them to get to their goal because everybody sees mm -hmm. the stuff the cool stuff and they go oh yeah i want to do that and and then you see where they're at physically and you go yeah no no that's not going to happen and it's right. nice to be able to say here is a pathway to get you there and it's not that we're saying no you can't do it it's that you need to follow these steps to be able to get to that thing at the end mm -hmm. right so definitely so um one of the things that I th thought was very interesting as I read through uh, some of your uh, material, and this is the first time that I've seen somebody say this, although I know people understand this and they know about this, particularly in gymnastics. One of the things that you talked about was conditioning your joints uh, for parkour. Um, mm -hmm. And I want you to explain to people, um, in, in, your, uh, in, your, in your opinion, why is it necessary to condition your joints for parkour activities? And then how is it that you accomplish this task? Right. Yeah, so I guess another reason that I've gotten or I've dove extremely deep into mobility, joint prep, strength, speed, power, all these different things, because I really see that as the base layer um, of the stack for parkour. So in parkour, one way I kind of think about it is there's really three main elements that you're training or building up. Um, the physical element, which is that base layer, and then you're layering on the technical or the skill training. And then finally, the, the top of the pyramid or however you want to imagine it is the mental aspect. Um, some people, they go straight to the techniques and skills and the mental stuff and they get up high and they want to challenge themselves mentally and um, their technique, but they have no um, basic strength or mobility. They can't squat down to the ground. They can't um, do a jump correctly or with strength and control. And so they get, they skip over that and they get up high and they break and they immediately hurt themselves. Or if they don't immediately hurt themselves over the long run. And actually this is what happened to me. So I'm a bit embarrassed to say this, but I did not have any guidance when I started parkour. And so what eventually happened is I, I hurt my knee pretty bad, a chronic injury. It was a runner's knee. And I tried everything to fix that. Nothing worked. So eventually I got surgery on it. And then I also eventually had to get a surgery on my right ankle because of anterior ankle impingement syndrome. Um, or as they know it, the technical term in parkour is ankle thingy. Uh, so, when, <laughs> so when you land and you compress your ankle too far uh, because you didn't have the control or the mobility or the strength, um, eventually I built up bone spurs in my ankles. Also, it was known, it used to be known as footballer's ankle. So I think the years of soccer and football and track and all that added up. I didn't even understand how tight my ankles were until I was in my 20s. And it was kind of too late um, to do anything about it. And so I had to get surgery. And then I'm sitting here, I'm like, why did this happen to me? Like, why did I get these, why did I get this knee surgery, this ankle surgery? What could I have done? How can I prevent this for other people? How can I learn from my mistakes? And at the time, especially like 10 years ago in parkour, I didn't see that many people talking about strength and conditioning, like hardly anyone would talk about that. And if they did talk about it, oftentimes it was very kind of like an outdated perspective. It was just like, 
oh, you just need to go out and run like five miles. And then we're going to do QM quadrupedal movement for like an hour. And we're just going to do thousands of reps at a low intensity. And that's how you get strong for parkour. And that kind of led me to be like, okay, well, I can see how that is one aspect, but what about actual like legit mobility training and actual like weightlifting? Hardly anyone in parkour was doing weightlifting until the past five or 10 years. And so all these things just led me to, to question my own experience and why did I get hurt and what could I do or what could I have done to prevent that? And at least for me was I had really good strength. I actually do treat things very cautiously. I have safe progressions. Um, I pay attention to all the little details technically. So why did I get hurt? And I really kind of point all that back to my extremely tight ankles. So I have terrible ankle dorsiflexion. And if you've got bad ankles, it, it kind of just, it works its way up the chain. You might experience that injury in your knee or your hip or your back or something else. And yeah, that's what happened to me. So I, I had to be really honest with myself and just admit like I messed up. I should have addressed my ankle mobility a long time ago. And if I would have done that, maybe I could have avoided all this and I could have spent more time training and less time sitting around um, watching everyone else have fun while I tried to rehab myself from injury. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, the full range of motion and conditioning your joints, um, as you were mentioning that and saying, oh, you know, if you don't have good ankle range of motion, it's going to work its way up. I had this image of David Bell jumping down three stories off of some precipice and yeah. like, you know, think about how much compressed, like jumping from one building to another, three stories, think about the compressive load that he has to absorb in his ankles, knees and hips. And he's able to jump. Like I, as an aside, I treat people, they fall four people off four, pardon me, they fall four feet off of a ladder and they smash their calcaneus into, <laughs> into smithereens. Right. David Bell jumped 35 feet off of one building onto another and then kept running. And I think like the amount of mobility and strength that you have to have in order to allow yourself to do that is, is absolutely ridiculous, right? Um, but yep. he shows you what you can accomplish over time if you build up and condition yourself to that right yeah 100 percent um and it goes to show like we yeah some people they'll they literally jump out of their truck bed and they destroy their leg or they destroy their ankle from two or three feet off the ground and then you've got parkour people doing 10x that and i think it, it really just shows um what the human body is capable of but you can't just start with that. You have to gradually work your way up. And unfortunately, as adults, you, you're probably, you've taken a few steps back and it's going to take even longer for you to build up to that. Um, mm -hmm. For example, we've got, we've taught kids here in Boulder and Denver, Colorado from when they were little kids and they refused to put shoes on and they just trained barefoot and they learned parkour and they have perfect mobility and strength and they maintain that all the way into some of them are adults now. And they can do some of what you're saying barefoot. And it goes to show what the human body is actually capable of if you train like that and if you maintain that for your whole life. Unfortunately, a lot of adults have lost that. And so it's going to take even longer. Um, if not, it actually, like, I'm never going to have ankles like some of my younger students. Um, but I should still be working to improve upon it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting. I, I like uh, there what you said about the, the, the kids. And we often, one of the things that we often say at our facility is that if you want to see how humans are supposed to, how they were meant to move, just watch the kids, right? Because definitely they, they, they particularly kids that have not yet gone to school, because um, the kids that have gone to school, they've been forced now to start to sit down and, and to um, wear shoes, you know, wear shoes and all of that. Yep. And if you want to see what they're, what we were supposed to be like, watch the kids that are not, have not yet gone to school because they move freely. They are, they have excellent mobility and they do the things that our bodies are meant to do um, without even thinking about it. Right. Right. And they all do parkour. 
So you yes. can just look at, you look at a little kid and they're doing parkour naturally. They're exploring their environment. They climb up the tree, they jump on the wall. And that's like, if you want to learn parkour, just look at what a little kid is doing and just follow them. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's really not that hard. <laughs> now, um, so you talked about some of your own mistakes. So um, tell me about what are some of the most common faults uh, and errors that you see new parkour athletes, um, you know, yeah. doing? Yeah, so I think we already covered one of the main ones, which is just skipping over strength and mobility and the physical base or foundation that they need to build up. Uh, so that's one of the major ones. Um, I think a lot of this is really just common sense, but it's also weird how a lot of people just ignore that, whether it's because of their ego or lack of instruction or who knows what, um, impatience maybe. I'd, I'd say, yeah, really, it's just about being smart, being patient. Don't go too hard, too fast. That wall, that challenge, that whatever thing you wanna work on is gonna be there next week, next month, next year, most likely. So you can always come back to it. Um, for example, the most recent post on my Instagram, I just posted it a few hours ago. Um, there's this jump. It's a big running jump. I step up and land on this wall that's um, about eight or nine feet away and two or three feet up. I've looked at it for years and I never did it until yesterday. And I'm 33 now. I'm 33 years old and I'm still breaking new jumps and completing new things that I never could do even in my 20s. Um, but it's because I'm patient. I'm cautious. I'm not in a rush. I'm going to work on my physical foundation. And when I feel it, when I'm in a, when I'm having a good day and I'm ready and I'm being honest with myself, then I'm going to push it. And I'm going to be very calculated about when and how I do that. And I, again, I really think it's just about this mentality. If you can embrace some of these ideas early on, then you're going to avoid a lot of the injuries um, and then be able to spend more time training and more time progressing. Okay. So, um, again, I've watched um, some of your stuff and, and um, you know, read through some of the material that you have. Um, and obviously, body weight training is a major part of, of what you do for uh, training for parkour. But mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised to see uh, that you also um, utilize conventional strength training. Um, you know, barbell stuff and, and that kind of um, right. things. So um, why do you combine these training techniques? And um, do you, is this just out of your personal interest because you did it in the past? Or do you think that this is actually necessary um, to achieve the goals of a parkour athlete? Yeah, yeah, it is 100% necessary if you want to reach your potential in parkour. And I think at this point in time, it's almost not even a debate, no matter what sport you're in, the top athletes are weightlifting. They're at least doing some kind of basic squat or deadlift or bench press or whatever that is. And luckily I was introduced to that at a very young age um, when I was just 13 or 14 years old, getting into football. My dad bought me um, a back squat and bench press rack in my basement. And I spent many a uh, late hour at night just by myself, you know, pumping out reps, trying to get stronger, trying not to be the scrawny, weak little kid on the football team that's brand new. And I took a lot of those lessons with me into parkour. So luckily when I got into parkour, I was already pretty strong. And I realized that about myself, like, oh, I'm strong. So I can maybe push this a little bit faster than those other people who they literally, you know, can't even back squat their own body weight or they can't bench press their own body weight. And at the time, you know, coming out of football and lifting and into parkour, I wasn't, I don't say, I wouldn't say I was enlightened in the area of strength training at the time. I was on my path. It's like the, I think it's called the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? It's like, at first you think you're super smart and you, you know everything. And then after a while, you realize you don't know anything. You're in that valley of despair. And then eventually over time, you build yourself back up and you start to realize how much you don't know. And um, so, yeah, I, at this point, I would say 100% you need to lift if you want to reach your potential as a jumping, landing, or power athlete. And I do consider parkour, at least the way that most people train it, to be a very like strength-based or power-based kind of activity. Um, even the basics, like being able to plant yourself up onto a waist-high wall 
or to be able to grab onto a head high wall and pull yourself up and over. If you do not have, like, if you can't do a pull up, there's no way you're going to be able to accomplish a climb up, which is pulling yourself up and over that wall. And so what we need to do is body weight training, you know, your basic pull ups and push ups and dips and handstands and um, pistol squats, shrimp squats for mobility training. But also, if we want to build up our legs, we need to do the lifting, like your basic back squat, split squat, deadlift. And then we also need to pair intelligent plyometric training with that if you want to reach your potential for um, jumping and landing. So we're doing depth jumps and box jumps. And um, recently, I've really been diving deep into track and field. Um, so the plyometrics that they do, you know, you're bounding, skipping, sprinting, um, all the training that they do for getting faster and more powerful. And yeah, so as parkour strength training and parkour in general, it's just like this. One thing I love about it is it's so wide. It's, it's multidisciplinary. So if you want to be the best you can be in parkour, you should probably spend some time studying rock climbing, gymnastics, breakdancing, martial arts, weightlifting, track and field. And the list goes on and on. And I feel like I've spent my the past 20 years, like slowly checking off like a basic level of competency and understanding in all of those different areas in order to become, um, in order to see the big picture. And I think a lot of people in parkour, they haven't of course reached that yet because it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of studying and research and self-testing and also experimenting and coaching other people. Um, I'm an extremely tight, stiff individual who is naturally also quite fast and powerful. Um, so it's pros and cons, but I've also worked with a lot of people who are hypermobile and they don't have that stiffness and stability and strength. And so this thing that came naturally to me, I have to figure out how can I get this person who has what I wish I had, which is mobility, but how can I give them what I have in areas of strength and stability and um, you really need everything. You need everything to do well at parkour. It's, um, I see a lot of other sports, like in rock climbing, they're very upper body dominant. And maybe they've got these scrawny little legs and they don't jump or land or squat or deadlift. Um, or some other sports, they, they're all legs and they don't even care about the upper body. They don't do pull-ups. They don't do dips. They maybe can't pull themselves up and over a wall if you tried or if you challenged them to. So that's one thing I love about parkour is just so multidisciplinary. I get to learn about all these different things. And when you reach that level of understanding in all these different sports and methods of training, then you arrive at, okay, here's what we got to do. And that's just a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I will say that I think that your approach is very systematic, you know, and if I, Think about other people that I follow uh, in this realm. And if I think about the guys from Store, or if I think about Dom <laughs> Tomato, to, yeah. like to me, I, I don't see them being this systematic. I, I think <laughs> it's just like, hey, what is that? Yeah, let's send it. And that's yeah. pretty much it, you know? And, and they've been fortunate to, um, you know, reach the level of proficiency they have without really having serious injury. But then again, I've, I've done videos on some of the guys from store and I, and I think I could do a mm. whole video just on Dom by himself, um, <laughs> all the injuries that he's had. So, um, you know, I, yeah. I, I really think that, um, you know, it's like you are the thinking man's parkour guy. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, you very organized, structured approach, which I it, like when you talk about it, that, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I do try to be that and try to bring that into parkour. And um, like we were talking about earlier, I have drawn so much inspiration from other systematic thinkers in the movement world. So um, Ido Portal and Christopher Summer and Kelly Starr and Carl Powley and like the list goes on and on. And um, yeah, I really appreciate how those guys approach what they do. And I've tried to bring that into parkour and apply it in kind of a new way. Um, but also just to go back like to the, the store guys and Dom Tomato. Um, I know those guys personally, or at least uh, some of them. And yeah, they, of course, they are some of the top athletes in the parkour world at this time. And I think, yeah, they maybe can appear a little reckless or, um, maybe that they don't think about this stuff, but I would actually argue that they, they do. And there is a lot of the stuff behind the scenes that 
you know, Instagram, a lot of people on Instagram, they're not going to show you the, the behind the scenes training or the, the many hours they spend thinking about it and, you know, mapping out how to get from where I want to be to where, or where I am to where I want to be. And Dom Tomato, for example, I know he has a background, an extensive background as a figure skater and all kinds of other sports. And he was a garbage man for a long time. And he was lifting, you know, tons of stuff all day long and probably building up incredible bone density and physical condition. And even though he maybe doesn't like lift all the time or whatever, um, he, you know, it's the elite level athletes have, they've spent decades, you know, building up to where they are. And, you know, even I'll admit actually right now with the pandemic for the past few months or whatever, um, I haven't lifted much at all. And um, sometimes over the years, you know, as a business owner and an entrepreneur, I've gone through phases where I couldn't do my own training. And luckily I'm coasting on decades of soccer and football and track and parkour. And it takes less effort to maintain that um, if you've already been there before. So I can get back to my levels um, with minimal training and, you know, Dom Tomato and uh, Callum Powell on store, he, he lifts a ton. He does have that systematic approach. Um, so I would actually, I would argue that even in parkour nowadays, some of the top athletes who maybe you don't see that or you don't recognize that immediately, it is there. It's just maybe that they're not talking about it too often cool. quite yet. Uh, Cause okay. it's not cool or it's not popular and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'll be, I'll be the one who's going to preach about, you know, lift your weights, do your mobility training, blah, blah, blah. I know it's boring, but like, you got to do it. <laughs> but you know what? It may not be cool now, but I think that there will come a time when people go, listen, man, like if I want to be at the top level, this is, this is how I roll, man. This is, these are the things that I do to get me there. And, and it will be cool to do that because you will see the difference between the people who are doing it and the people who are not, right? So I, I think it will, that will come into vogue at some point. Right. And it, it definitely has been on that trend. Like 10 years ago in parkour, there were actual serious debates where people said, you don't need to lift. And they would passionately defend this idea that you don't need to lift, you don't need to strength train. And it's, that's not really an issue anymore, um, which is good to see. And I do think, you know, if a lot of people, they, at least back in the day, not so much now, but they'd see this top athlete in parkour and they'd be like, oh, so-and-so can jump so far and they don't even lift. And then my response is, well, so-and-so can jump so far in spite of not lifting. And if they actually did train a little more intelligently, How they would be farther? they would be even more amazing. So, yeah, I, I hope to see more of those guys get into it. Okay, um, so we talked a little bit about QM quadru quadrupedal movement. Um, mm -hmm. So, explain to me what is the role of quadrupedal and primal uh, movements in parkour? Yeah, uh, so we kind of start that out with most beginners. They're just doing quadrupedal movement. And I actually, an analogy is how a baby learns to move. So babies originally, you know, their first kind of A to B locomotive type stuff is like wiggling and scooting and crawling and slithering, like kind of forms of quadrupedal movement, basically. And so that's how a baby learns how to move. And that's how our beginners learn how to move in parkour. Um, they start with our equivalent of crawling is quadrupedal movement. And it's just a really good way to kind of start out low impact, low to ground, um, low intensity. And at the same time, it's good conditioning for their wrists. You know, they got to put their wrists flat on the ground and support their weight and um, develop a little bit of core stability to not like wobble all over the place. And eventually we make that a little faster. We start progressing it off of the ground and quadrupedal movement is actually like a prerequisite for a vault. So if you want to do a vault over a waist high wall, um, really what it is, is you run up, you do some kind of a jump or a takeoff, and then you put your hands and your feet, hands and or feet on the wall, and it's some form of quadrupedal movement. And then depending on the outcome of that vault, you do a good landing or a fall or a roll. And so before people get to the vault, before I even want to teach someone a vault, I want to know that they have all the prerequisites beforehand. So do they know how to do QM? Do they know how to run and jump and land and fall? And once I've kind of checked off all these things, then we can introduce the vault and we're going to have a lot more success and we're going to probably be a lot safer as they get to that as well. Okay. Um, so 
Um, an extension of that now, because you talked about, oh, do they know how to fall? So what is the role of proprioception in, in parkour? Um, and how do you develop this in athletes? Hmm. Uh, proprioception is one of those words. I feel like it's, it kind of means different things to different people. So what do you, can you elaborate what you mean by proprioception? Certainly. So um, I'm talking about just the general sense of one's ability to recognize where your body is in space. Right. Yeah. So of course that's huge in parkour. And I think pretty much everything we're doing is actually, you could even argue like parkour is basically about building better proprioception in all areas of movement so that you can apply it to like, if you do parkour, you'll apply it to parkour. If you do football or soccer or track or whatever, like, I do believe that parkour, the, the skills, the proprioceptive knowledge, the strength, the mobility, all of these things that you get from parkour is incredible cross-training for athletes in all other sports too. Um, I see so many athletes now who do other sports and they've got, they're jumping and landing with their feet super wide apart. The feet are collapsing inward. The knees are caving in. Um, their arms are all over the place. Their, their back is slouched over. And these are all things that you could have learned so quickly in parkour. And if you just clean those little basics up, I think it's going to make you a better athlete, no matter what your goals or what your sport is. For sure. For sure. Uh, and I, again, to, to go back to Dom and, and to the guys from store, um, I don't know why, maybe because I've just been, I've been watching it on my YouTube feed, but I've seen mm -hmm. a couple of videos recently um, with, uh, um, uh, the boys doing uh, precision landings onto pier, uh, onto over water, onto pier. Yeah, the water pier challenges. Pools, right? And yeah. I just think, like, just trying to get the average person to do a 10-foot jump and land on the pavement where you could <laughs> land anywhere you want is yeah. difficult enough. But to do a precision landing onto... Uh, you know, a surface that is basically a foot and a half by a foot and a half, right? And to be able to land, gather yourself up, control your momentum, like that, yeah. is, to me, that's the pinnacle of proprioceptive ability, right? To be able to do that, because if, if you can just land and roll, land, run it out, land, break, fall, whatever, like that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. You have to have the power and you have to have enough proprioception you can get your feet or your shoulder underneath you. But to be able to do a precision landing like that, that, like you need to know where everything is in space and in a split second, gather it all together, boom, and stop. Yeah. So I yeah, think and that's amazing. And going back to what we were talking about before, the, it really, those guys are perfect examples of the full package and the full package meaning physical technical mental so they got that physical foundation and they're capable of doing this 10 foot jump on flat ground um, but on top of that they're adding a ton of like technical elements especially as you land on precise targets like a rail or a little you know pillar in the middle of a river in um, germany um, but then you if they're doing that off the bridge to this thing up high with water and potentially taking a big drop into the water, um, even though it's water, you can get seriously hurt doing that. So there, then we're, we're taking into account the mental factor as well. So yes, you can do this 10 foot jump on flat ground and you can do it uh, maybe to a low wall and you can add that technical component. But then when it's 20 feet above the water on this intimidating bridge and you've got all these other factors, then it's a mental game. And that's where a lot of people stop. They don't push it that far. They, they get the stuff on flat ground and that's totally fine. I mean, even like in most of my training, I'm a little more low to ground and that's just a uh, kind of like a personal choice. And, um, but the highest level people, if it's flat ground or if it's hundred feet off the ground, it doesn't matter to them. It's the same thing either way, because of all of the hours they've put into the physical foundation, the technical training and the, the underrated vast, incredible thing of mastering their own mind like I, I don't even know how to put that into words but when you know you can do something 
I know I can do a standing jump of, you know, nine or 10 feet on flat ground. But when you add a 100 foot drop in between those two targets, I don't care who you are at first, you're going to face some serious like inner demons. You're going to hate yourself because you're like, why can't I do this? It's the same thing. Like the little voice in the back of my head, it's like paralyzing me on top of this wall and you get scared and you deal with so much that, um, yeah, the mental training can be such an important element that you don't have to go onto a roof to face that. Uh, some people, they even, they experience that on flat ground. They experience that on a, a knee high wall or a waist high wall. And I think that that's a really important thing to face. Um, people need to scare themselves more often. They need to do so in a controlled and safe way. But we live in this world now where, you know, if I don't want to talk to anyone, I just put my headphones in, I put my head down, I walk down the street, I don't make eye contact, I I get to control everything I do because it's comfortable and it's easy. And too many people are just too stuck in that. And we need to break out of that. And I think in that sense, um, parkour. So I'm a big proponent of stoicism, um, not because I don't have emotion or I don't want to show emotion or whatever. It's more about the idea of can I face adversity and stay calm and composed? And can I recognize what I can control and what I cannot control? If I can control it, do something about it, take action. If I can't control it, don't worry about it. Don't stress over it. And when you learn these lessons and you kind of apply these ideas, it's almost like parkour is a, a physical expression or practice of stoicism or ideas that will make you a stronger individual, not only in athletics, but also in business, in relationships, in life. Um, I, I would love to see people, more people take the lessons of parkour and apply them to all these other things because it's about being brave and having courage and being creative, seeing things in a different way, breaking something down into little baby steps and doing the work to get from where you are to where you want to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Yet mm -hmm. when you are a bit afraid, that is where the learning occurs, right? Like as yep. soon as you come outside of your zone of comfort, it's like, whoa, okay, I got to learn something here. You know? Yeah, it, it reminds me of that meme that you see online. It's like a circle and it says inside of the circle, it just writes like comfort zone. And then it says or suggests that where the magic happens is outside of the circle. Exactly. So, so exactly. actually through, through parkour, I guess really that's what I'm trying to do is through my daily practice of parkour, it's just like get outside of the comfort zone if only for five, 10 minutes a day. And then it just, it's almost like a way to condition your mind and then apply that to other things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna f wrap up soon because I can see the time is running, running out. Uh, okay. A couple more questions. So sure. you talked a little bit about this, um, uh, incorporating progressions. So how, just give me, give us a, an example of how you incorporate progression uh, into your strength training, um, particularly if it is skill-based. Hmm. Skill-based strength training? Yeah. So, you know, okay. say, for example, I watch, um, so uh, if I think back to your, um, some of your Instagram posts, okay, and I, and I saw, um, I saw, um, I, I don't know the name of the girl that, that works with you, uh, but I saw her doing um, some pistol squats and various hmm. progression of that skill. Um, so talk to us about how you break that down for people? Yeah, so it, it depends a lot on the skill. Um, for a pistol squat, of course, you got to identify it. So a lot of people are like, I can't do a pistol squat. What do I do? And it's like, okay, why can't you do it? Is it because you don't have control or balance? Is it because you don't have the strength? Is it because you have no ankle dorsiflexion? And so you just fall back as soon as you hit your end range or bottom range of motion. Um, so you got to identify I like to use various assessments that identify, okay, what is the problem? Because it could be different things. And depending on what the problem is, then we're going to solve that with different solutions. So um, for example, the pistol squat, you could elevate the heel if they lack an ankle dorsiflexion. If they lack the balance or the strength or the control, they can just grab a pole or a wall or something next to them for support and give a little bit of like an upper body assist. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways we do that. And I guess a really common one for a lot of the things that we work on is the jump assist with the eccentric. So a lot of people don't have the strength to do an actual pull up 
or an actual push up or dip or climb up when they're climbing up and over the wall. So what we'll do is teach them various ways to kind of run into it or jump into it to get that um, upper body assist or lower body assist, um, extra momentum and power into it, and then letting it down as slow as you can is going to help you build some of the same strength that you need um, to eventually do it on your own. So there's all kinds of ways to do it. And really what the main key is that you have, and this is what a lot of coaches don't have, but you need to have progressions. You need to be able to see the person doing the thing that you want them to do and then identify, okay, was that challenging enough or do we need to make it a little bit harder or do we need to make it a little bit easier? And you should be ready to scale up and down with all these various progressions, which you know, like it might be a simple task for most people, but when you get to be this coach who works with tons of people, you've got to have this vast arsenal of uh, strategies and progressions depending on the individual. Uh, and, I, and I think whether you're talking about parkour, football, um, you know, martial arts, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I think progressions is one of the most important things that a, a good coach has to have. Because as you said, you know, you need to be able to understand how to, um, how to construct the bridge between where this person is now and mm -hmm. where you want them to be in um, steps that are easily consumable by that particular person, right? Because I'm right. sure, you know, you, you, you could have one athlete says, oh, I want to do that skill. And you go, oh, this dude is a stud. I only got to help him teach him this one thing. Boom, he can do that. And then there's other people you go, oh, this is going to be long. And I, mm -hmm. and I have to really break this down into small steps in order to get them to do it. Right. You know? Yeah, and uh, another thing that comes to mind is this idea of the zone of proximal development. So you want people to be in this little area that is not too challenging where they're get, getting frustrated or hurt or whatever, but it also can't be too easy where they're just like, oh, this is stupid and pointless and like, why are we even doing this? Like, I want to do backflips. Like, I'm here to learn a backflip. When will we get into backflips? And it's like, oh, well, you can't even do a back roll. You can't do a, a squat or a landing or a jump. Like, we're going to work on these basics and then you're going to get there. And um, we're going to find a way to make it challenging for you so that you're engaged and safe, but challenged. And that's the zone of proximal development where I think parkour people, they get really good at finding, they get, they find that little like perfect sweet spot where they're adequately challenged and engaged, but also safe. Okay. So um, we're getting down to brass tacks here. Last question. Um, what are, if I had, if you had to give, three tips um if you want had to give three tips for somebody who's doing parkour um and there are three tips for training safety but also for developing proficiency and i know it's hard to to, to condense it down into just three mm -hmm. but give me three because i know you could probably talk about a billion sure but give me three yeah yeah, I've mentioned a few of them already. So to reiterate, because they are super important that we install this mindset is uh, start with the stuff that is simple, not the complex stuff. If you start with the complex stuff, you're going to get overloaded and it might be way harder. So start out simple and then also start out low to ground. You don't want to go straight up to the, the roof gap or the you know height training. So start low and gradually work your way up to like little curbs and then knee high walls and then waist high walls and take your time. Just start out low to ground because that's where it's a bit safer. You're not going to get hurt as easily down low. And then maybe another one is uh, start off slower and eventually build up the speed and the, the dynamic kind of power elements. And then also just to throw one more in there, um, learn how to land and fall and bail and fail in a successful and safe way before you need it. <laughs> and what I mean by that is learn how to roll on flat ground before you're doing like vaults or something else high up where if you mess up, you're going to need to roll. So mm -hmm. a lot of people, they learn that thing before they actually have a decent roll and then they mess up and then they have a bad roll and then they get hurt. So learn the necessary falls and rolls and bails before you need them. That's a really key one as well. Okay. Very cool. Um, so this is, uh, had, has been very educational and, and uh, 
there's uh, already just in this hour, there's been a lot that you've taught me, and, and uh, I think I would like to revisit this again at some point in the, in the future. Um, but uh, to um, for everybody who is uh, here um, and who will see this once we post it up on our YouTube channel, tell them where they can find you uh, and if they want to learn more about what you do and about what you offer, uh, tell them how they can do that. Sure. So uh, I guess I'm most active on social media as far as Instagram and YouTube. Um, so of course on here, Ryan M. Ford on Instagram. And then actually I've just really, I used to be pretty big in the YouTube game, but it took some uh, years off and now I'm getting back into it. And I just recently added almost 200 uh, parkour strength demo clips, progressions, um, things that are, the, the goal is to actually use this like reference material for my students. And when I, assign online training programs to people all over the world. Um, they can reference our videos there. So check me out on YouTube. Um, it's called Demon Drills, or just search my name, Ryan Ford. Um, I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well. And then my main websites are parkouredu.org. That's where we do a lot of online training um, for parkour and power and mobility and strength. And we have coaching certifications and um, we're really, especially nowadays in the, the pandemic age, we're going to be pushing the online stuff pretty hard um, coming up here soon. And then my gyms are called Apex School of Movement, um, which you can find here in Denver, Colorado, as well as San Diego, California. And then, yeah, so apexmovement.com, parkouredu.org, and Instagram and YouTube are my main places. All right. Giddy up. Thank you very much. So uh, hang tight. Uh, while I sign everybody off and uh, I'll finish up with you on Zoom. So everybody cool. who stuck around to listen to the conversation, thank you very much for participating. It, it, uh, I know it was educational for me and I hope that it was educational for you and uh, look forward to seeing you guys next week. Um, I don't remember who it is, who is the guest, but um, I will put it out at the beginning of the week. So I hope to see you guys then. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you then. Thanks a lot.